Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this lecture on the 19th century novel, I will discuss some of the major novels as well as some of the major concerns of the novels. So, uh, the English novel uh, previously used to be a collection of short stories or uh, it used to be uh, about um, extended uh, short stories which we call the novelas and uh, much of it was autobiographical writing too and the major uh, subject matter of such fiction used to be uh, illicit or forbidden uh, romantic entanglements. Um, so, illicit sexuality was a major preoccupation of the uh, novel uh, content and uh, we have uh, two set of uh, female writers Delaware Manley and Eliza Haywood who kind of wrote fiction that touched on all these aspects uh, such as you know forbidden romantic um, you know stuff and um, much of it was autobiographical. Um, but um, in, in uh, Defoe's last novel, Roxana, it was also about uh, the fictional memoir of a restoration courtesan. So, uh, the idea that uh, fiction is associated with uh, illicit sexuality is continued uh, in uh, many of the uh, literary uh, novels, uh, including Defoe's uh, Roxana, which, as I said, is about um, the uh, narratives of a restoration courtesan or prostitute. So, uh, the two famous works of Haywood and Manley are shown here. One is titled uh, Love and Excess um, or The Fatal Inquiry, which um, again the, uh, the genre is mentioned in block uh, letters uh, as a novel. And uh, this is amatory fiction, um, fiction that is to do with uh, um, sex and, and romance and it is about a fallen woman. Fallen women is a reference to pr prostitutes or, or women who have had uh, illicit sexuality um, you know as part of their lives. And the other one is uh, by Manley which is uh, secret memoirs and manners of several persons of quality of both sexes from the new Atlantis, an island in the Mediterranean. So, this work contrary to this one is um, about politics, it is a political allegory and it exposed the misdemeanors of the day in relation to the public affairs. So, uh, while the novel is about uh, autobiographical uh, narratives, while it is about illicit sexuality, it is also about um, political um, affairs. So, these are some of the major concerns that we can see popping out uh, uh, from the narratives, from the fictional narratives of the day. So, the 18th century novel had romance, it had adventure and it also asked this question how did one live. Um, it, though it is not precisely a conduct book, the novel did discuss some of the ways in which one could live adequately, satisfactorily and also in uh, conjunction with the precepts laid down by um, the Bible, by the spiritual textbooks and by the spiritual um, advices of the day. And, um, Further, uh, the novel was uh, seen as enlarging one's lives. Um, that was a major function of the novel of the period. It expanded um, the ways into which people um, could live. And um, the other major uh, function uh, that the novel offered was safe access into other class positions. Uh, uh, even though the reader is middle class and is reading in or in his or her living room, um, that reader is allowed um, safe passage into the lifestyles of other class positions which are either above that reader or beneath the reader's class position. So, that kind of um, interesting and significant uh, uh, function was offered by the novel. The other themes of the English novel are uh, bourgeoisie themes in that it was about uh, class as I said uh, in a, a, a brief while ago. It was about industry, industry in the sense it was about um, hard work. Uh, 
the work ethic that was becoming very, very uh, important to the middle classes, which was raising in, uh, in, in society presence, its influence through the dint of hard work. And uh, it was also about social advancement, how one could uh, climb the ladders of uh, the, class, uh, the classes in society and how one could also exploit social systems that were, that were in place in that day. So, uh, these are some of the major concerns of the English novel of that period, class, professionalism or hard work, um, you know, social climbing, the idea of social climbing and, uh, you know, working the system in your favor. The 19th century novel um, has these significant modes, uh, literary modes such as the silver folk novels, the Victorian novels and other sub-genres such as sensation fiction and gothic fiction which continued to be uh, you know uh, written in, in a minor way in that period. So Jane Austen is a, a important figure uh, in the early 19th century um, and um, Though Jane Austen did not capture the rapid social change that was um, kind of sweeping across British society, um, the other fiction such as um, you know, the Victorian fiction did capture that rapid uh, rise of industrialization and the consequent impact of industrialization on uh, the society. In Jane Austen we do uh, see changes but in a very, very subtle way um, uh, uh, whereas in, in Victorian fiction uh, we see it in a very obvious way, uh, for example, in, in the works of Charles Dickens, we see uh, different kinds of important factors that, that were kind of making, um, you know, radical changes in the lives of the people. So uh, rapid social change is something that um, the novels captured in their pages and uh, the possibility of revolution hitting um, uh, Britain was also kind of addressed uh, in a marginal way by um, writers such as uh, Dickens for, for instance A Tale of Two Cities which we will read for the course um, does uh, uh, touch on that possibility in an indirect way by looking at the French Revolution. So um, in terms of the British context the writers did um, uh, take into account the social, the social changes that were uh, happening across society. Silver folk, silver folk fiction is a popular uh, sub-genre of the period and it was a novel uh, of fashionable high life. Um, it captured the upper class society's preoccupations, concerns and their routines and they were popular in the 1820s and 18. 30s. Um, Benjamin Disraeli, the Countess of Blessington, Catherine Gore, Edward Bulwer Lytton are some of the uh, writers who wrote um, this kind of fiction, silver folk fiction uh, of the up upper class society. So, in other words, um, one of the major uh, uh, functions or concerns of silver folk genre is to package aristocratic high society for the benefit of the middle classes who kind of devoured these narratives about these um, uh, people from the high society so that they could somehow adopt some of the aspects of high society for instance in with regard to dress, um, you know, uh, clothing, outfits and the way um, the high society had their own uh, unique etiquette and others, other things like that. So uh, this is the title page um, of one of the novels which can be categorized as silver folk fiction and this is uh, Pelham or uh, the adventures of a gentleman and um, to be precise um, the gentleman of the upper class uh, society or aristocratic society and this was written by Sir Edward Bulwer uh, Lytton who was also part of that um, uh, class in, 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 in British society. So again, uh, representation um, of the high life and, and silver folk fiction dealt with such um, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And um, as I mentioned before, these novels acted as guides, um, as guides to fashionable living for the middle classes and lower middle classes who could somehow in their own ways imitate uh, some of the aspects of the high life. 
So, what is the agenda of the Silver Folk novels? Uh, the Silver Folk novels offer tantalizing, attractive glimpses into the high life, into aristocratic society. However, while it did offer attractive glimpses, it also exposed some of its downsides, the negative sides to high society. Uh, while it did that, it also did something else which was to ridicule, mock the bourgeoisie hangers on uh, who tried to kind of climb into that particular high society. So, uh, it, it also ridiculed people who tried to imitate or enter this particular um, class. So, it was doing a combination of things, uh, it made the society very attractive, but it also exposed its um, you know uh, negative downsides, uh, negatives or downsides and it also ridiculed people who tried to um, enter that particular uh, societies, that particular society. Vanity's, uh, Vanity Fair, Thackeray's Vanity Fair was massively influenced by, uh, was influenced by silver folk fiction. Uh, in fact, it can be seen as a, a mockery of uh, the aristocratic society. And uh, what it tried to do was to integrate uh, middle class characters and ideals into aristocratic uh, high society. That was uh, one of the major uh, functions of uh, silver folk fiction. So, um, it was trying to reform uh, aristocratic uh, high society by bringing into it some of the admirable qualities of middle class society. And um, in other words, it also tried to extend this kind of reformation into 19th century politics itself. So, aristocracy was being reformed um, through uh, the middle class values. So, these are some of the interesting aspects of uh, silver folk fiction. Vanity Fair by Thackeray is a, a major novel in the 19th century and um, what are some of the f major features of this uh, novel? They ha it had spaciousness, uh, this novel was capacious, it had a huge cast of characters, um, the landscape was vast, the narrative landscape was vast, it did offer a panoramic view of 19th century society. While uh, it did that, while panoramic picture was offered, the novel also offered depth um, in terms of the profundity uh, with which um, some of the major uh, issues were uh, discussed uh, through that fictional uh, rendering of, of society in Vanity Fair. And there was also a massive psychological grasp on the part of uh, the author uh, in his uh, dealing delineation of several characters and the events that unfolded in uh, Vanity Fair. So, while um, the society was uh, neatly described uh, in, in all its complexities, um, the author was also uh, profoundly aware of, uh, um, of the nerve centers in society. Um, Thackeray knew about the axis, about the axis around which the society functioned. The society functioned around the axis of class, it uh, functioned around the society, on the axis of um, power and um, gender and um, empire. Uh, all these axes uh, were kind of subtly captured in Vanity Fair. Now, let us look at uh, some of the various modes, sub-genres um, that uh, are associated with the 19th century novel, which are um, social realism, sensationalism, historical fiction, fantasy. So, uh, these are some of the ma major um, sub-genres of the novel and we have uh, writers uh, who uh, kind of um, wrote uh, in relation to these modes, uh, you know, in terms of sensationalism, we have Wilkie Collins. And in terms of um, social realism, we have Gaskell, other figures. Let us kind of um, take a quick look back uh, at uh, the major uh, issues that I have discussed uh, in relation to the themes or the concerns of the 19th century novel. So, uh, one is uh, 
masculinity uh, masculinity is is a major uh, concern or issue that is uh, discussed um, in in the uh, 19th century novel the figure of the new woman also comes up uh, um, in the novels of the late 19th century sexuality as i mentioned has been a consistent uh, uh, theme of the novel genre you know from the, from its early days um, the, uh, and again childhood is also a dominant concern of um, Victorian 19th century uh, uh, novel and immediately when we think of um, you know, the idea of childhood we, we go back to novels such as Jane Eyre if you look at Jane Eyre um, the novel begins with Jane as a small child and then it, it captures her uh, development into a young woman and, and um, you know other stages are, are discussed but childhood is a major preoccupation of uh, Jane Eyre the novel and uh, we also uh, see an interest in um, the way landscapes are uh, portrayed, discussed, narrated in uh, fiction. So Elizabeth Gaskell immediately comes to mind. Uh, we also uh, think about Jane Austen's uh, countryside, um, the presence of the countryside in uh, Austen's fiction and empire also becomes a dominant theme um, in the works of Wilkie Collins and other writers. Um, you know, late 19th century we think of Kipling and, and other writers and um, this uh, uh, next um, concern that I've put down on the slide here uh, is, um, is is about this dialogue that happens, the conversation that happens between image and text. And uh, we need to remember that in, in the 19th century, uh, we had uh, novels being published um, in the form of serials, in, in weekly editions of newspapers and as parts um, in monthly editions and then all these were collected uh, and published in volume forms at the uh, you know once the novel is finished and images did play a major role in attracting readership so um, the text is also illustrated the major events in the text is also illustrated by the images and there was a, a, a constant ideological interplay between image and text in many of the 19th century novels in fact when we read a tale of the two cities for this uh, course I'll show you consistently the different images that illustrated different parts of the text and how these images captured um, or how these images differed from the uh, the representations in uh, in the novel um, the textual representations in the novel so um, again the other concern is evolution um, you know how human beings evolved and illness also becomes a major concern and in terms of illness we have um, uh, Milky Collins's fiction uh, discussing uh, this subject matter in great uh, depth and uh, further um, aspects um, that get importance in the 19th century fiction is the nature of work, what, what is um, ideal work, um, uh, also uh, what uh, the professions, what are the professions that are um, important for, for the middle classes and these are uh, discussed and um, narrative experience, how, how, how do we uh, narrate experience um, in, in uh, fiction and again um, and individualism uh, you know what what is uh, individualism and all these concerns can be uh, part of um, our interpretations of the 19th century novel in vanity fair uh, the question that becomes very very important is who inherits the property um, in fact this question can be asked of any 19th century novel who gets the money at the end of the day so this becomes as I said one of the major concerns of the Victorian uh, novel or the 19th century novel who gets the uh, money at the end of the day where does money go uh, from whom to whom and um, again the novel seems to be conscious of time melting time passing uh, Vanity Fair is extremely conscious of this uh, mm, you know feature and we can almost sense that uh, sense the way in which time floats away into the past and um, it's usually seen as a typical 19th century novel it is also historical novel um, something that we need to remember and um, 
various critics also suggest that uh, you know uh, the 19th century novel is impossible to replicate uh, um, because it is too panoramic it, it, it is too profound and its canvas is too vast these are something that is impossible to recapture today so uh, again the Victorian novel talks about hidden power structures. Um, you know, uh, when we read a Victorian novel very closely, we can um, analyze uh, and, and we can probe as to what are the important power structures in society and which get reflected uh, uh, in the uh, in the fiction. And um, we can also see that. Um, the Victorian novel captures a society which is under stress. Uh, there is rapid industrialization, the society is changing, the class structures are um, sort of undergoing a big shake and then there is uh, colonialism um, and, and empire building that is happening um, uh, uh, across the globe and, and um, you know these are affecting human minds. In fact, people are unable to rely, uh, they are unable to uh, find certainties um, in in um, in the world outside them. Therefore, in in such a context, uh, the narrator figure in nineteenth century fiction becomes very very interesting because the narrator becomes a source of authority, and the narrator is very very knowledgeable. In fact, too knowledgeable and too authoritative in some cases because the narrator is uh, tries to uh, be preemptive. The narrator tries to set our minds in a particular way. The narrator fixes our forward imaginings. The to tells us what to think. So, the downside to a very authoritative uh, narrator is also there in a 19th century fiction. Uh, Vanity Fair is also very interesting uh, in, in relation to this idea that uh, it is a novel without a hero. In fact, the heroine is the most important uh, figure in the novel, um, Becky Sharp. Becky Sharp is the hero. If you want to have a hero, she is the hero um, who kind of um, dominates the plot. Even though we have another um, female uh, protagonist, Amelia Sedley, it is Becky Sharp who is um, the masterful uh, character in the entire novel. She is the most memorable character, in fact. Uh, and um, we can see in uh, Amelia Sedley cloyed emotions, which again is a major uh, element of 19th century uh, fiction uh, and uh, social climbing in relation to Becky Sharp, which again is a major 19th century uh, concern. And marriage plot uh, is a major plot um, character of the Victorian or the 19th century fiction. So, uh, domestic uh, aspects or domesticity, um, romance and marriage become uh, key elements of 19th century fiction and through this uh, plotting through this uh, type of plot other issues other issues are discussed um, by the uh, author other issues being political affairs social affairs are uh, discussed through the marriage plot so what is the object of the vanity fair i would like to um, conclude this um, uh, lecture session with this quotation which is very very significant um, the object of Vanity Fair is this, to indicate in cheerful terms that we are for the most part an, an abominably foolish and selfish people, desperately wicked and all eager after vanities. I want to leave everybody dissatisfied and unhappy at the end of the story. We ought all to be with our own and all other stories. Good God, don't I see in that maybe cracked and warped looking glass in which I am always looking, my own weaknesses, wickednesses, lusts, follies, shortcomings, we must lift up our voices about these and howl to a congregation of fools so much as um, at least has been my endeavor. So, uh, this is the narrator talking to the readers and he says that I want to 
tell the readers how bad they are, um, you know, what kind of weaknesses and wickedness and, and lusts and follies um, uh, uh, which are a part of their lives. And he says that we should look at us, we should look at us in the mirror of um, the fiction. So Vanity Fair itself becomes a mirror uh, at which readers can look at and see their own, um, you know, uh, follies and characteristics reflected back to them. So this is what he wants to do and he says that I want to leave everybody dissatisfied and unhappy at the end of the story because that's how life is. Nobody is satisfied, nobody is happy at the end of the day or at the end of one's lives and he wants to tell people um, about all their vanities after which everybody runs and, and he wants to tell the readers how foolish and selfish they are for the most part, for the most part, he doesn't say for the entirely but um, for the most part we are abominably foolish, uh, embarrassingly foolish and selfish and wicked, desperately wicked, we are um, dreadfully wicked. So uh, Vanity Fair's objective are these which um, which Thackeray wants to offer to the reader. So we can see that very clearly uh, 19th century fic uh, fiction has an agenda to fulfill which is this to somehow offer some kind of message to the readers it wants to do that so under 19th century fiction uh, if you look at it as a category we have you know the subgenres of sensationalism um, you know social realism we have the gothic mode we have uh, the fantasy uh, we have um, you know uh, books that focus on, on, on children um, and so uh, we have conduct literature and other stuff so we have all these various narratives but the dominant uh, mode or the, uh, the dominant agenda of these writings is that um, there is some kind of message for the readers within that uh, narrative. So Vanity Fair very obviously states that through the voice of the narrator here. Uh, thank you for um, listening, I will continue the next session.